Fallout 3 opens with the crackling of a tube sputtering the life as the camera pans up to reveal a tchotchke from another era. And as we pull back, we see the blown out carcass of a bus. And later, the bus opens up into the gaping void of the empty capital wasteland, with the sound of the radio echoing out like the ghost of civilization. This is the first impression that Fallout 3 gives, and it's a strong picture that it paints. And I'd give it more credit if Fallout 1 hadn't done the same thing years ago. It's Fallout 3, colon, we tried our best. You just came here, the video just started, and I've already made a joke calling Bethesda visionless hacks. And listen. I don't know what the hell I'm talking about, that's true. I do what one could vaguely call a job, and yeah, sure, I'm a clown, I do some clowning around, but I'm also a serious man engaging in what could be called serious business. But the thing is, you don't bring attention to the game. You don't come right out and say it. That's like being the first dude to brag about all the money he made selling crack. Sure, you got a handy in the backseat of your Cadillac, but rap snitches telling all they business sit in the court and be their own star witness. After the intro, we have a paint by numbers picture of the world of Fallout. Gravelly voiced dude saying war never changes. War. War never changes. Check. Long backstory told by narrator? Check. New cast of colorful factions and characters? Check. I mean, I mean, what? What did you say? Now the OG fallouts happened way over here, and this new one happened way over here. But regardless of how dumb this all sounds, you got all your fan favorites. Super Mutants, Brotherhood of Steel, The Enclave, X-Wings! All in one city. Fallout 3 took place in DC, but why? Did it need to be completely dislocated from the original games? I mean, the game uses all the tropes set up by the previous games, and would have, by any stretch of the imagination, been better off set in the same environment, but no, screw that. We need our own sandbox, and that's fine, but sandboxes are for imagination, and all you did was change the location of the sandbox from the desert to the middle of the city, and to make it worse, you tried a city on the other side of the continent, which raises more questions about your setting than you seem willing to explain. Fallout is about survival. Having a location change from the inhospitable desert to a city with lots of infrastructure, some of it's still working. It takes a little of the desperation that you might feel when confronted with survival in such places. That's why the game over screen of Fallout 1 is your corpse, bleaching, skinless in the desert sun. The environment is part of selling the mirage, the illusion that the desert is an enemy you must contend with, because it is a believably scary place already. The desert is famous for killing people, and DC is famous for housing the largest number of entitled douchebags on the planet. Honestly, I think DC was used not because it would be more interesting, but that DC was closer so they didn't need to buy plane tickets to do reference collection. I mean, they strike me as that type of company. But I remember when this came out, there was a lot of pressure on Bethesda to pull off a sequel, and what kind of sequel would this feel like if instead of having super mutants, we had cliff racers? You know, it would have felt bad because I know I wanted more of the same slop I had gotten the last time, and if they screwed up the recipe, I was going to send the soup back to the kitchen. So, and it pains me to say this, trust me, but it's kind of amazing they managed to make this game as boring as it is, and I still gobbled it up like the hungry fanboy that I was. And while I have you, I just want to ask you a favor. Hit the subscribe button if you like this content, and if you really like the content, hit the like button, and maybe comment below. And then also, head over to my Patreon. It's the way I keep this channel alive, because ads ain't doing it. So kick me a buck over there if you want to support the channel, and on with the content. Hey, people always ask me, Paulie, what was it like to kill someone for the first time? And no one ever believes me when I tell them. The first person I killed was my mom, and I didn't feel nothing about it because I was so good at killing it half the time I didn't even mean to kill the guy. James. She's in cardiac okay. arrest. Start compression. My dad was gone a lot during the day, so I would get in the sh- ah. As I should, I mean, I'm a baby. I mean, who leaves their baby home alone like that? You know what I mean? And whenever he come home, I'd be jumping on his bed, and I don't think the guy actually cared all that much because he was always telling me ah. about the Bible. And listen, I'm a God-fearing man, 
but I think God didn't have a problem with killing. I think he had a problem with us killing people before he can get around to it himself. I think God likes killing, smiting this town over here, killing all the people over here, sacrificial lambs. Yeah, I'm pretty sure he liked killing, but he needs help. He can't just get to it all in one day. So I just, you know, I clean up the people he forgot. God isn't one of those kind of guys that cleans the corners of places when he mops. So sometimes he needs someone to come in and get the spots he missed. That's all. That's me. That's what I do. I get the corners. This whole scene exists to show you a book, which was Bethesda's neat little take on a character sheet. And I know I've said this about a million times, but I hate character creation screens that don't show me the derived stats in real time on the screen as I'm creating my character. Just putting some numbers in some categories does not give me the full picture of what's happening when I make a choice. So how do I know if I want to make the choice I'm making? It's a freaking guessing game. And I harp on derived stats for a good reason, at least I think I, I harp on them for a good reason. Like, to me, derived stats are the stats that interact directly with the player, right? It's the statistical layer that translates directly into gameplay. It's not my strength that causes my damage to happen the way it does. Strength is only a part of the equation. Damage which is the derived stat, the stat that gets all of its stats from other stats, that is what determines how much damage I do. It's like a direct translation from button press to action to consequence. That's why derived stats are very important. Those are the stats that, if anything, you should see on screen. So dad tells me about the Bible, which convinces me that the scene is here for no other reason than to repeat the Bible passage. That way, when they repeat it at the end of the game, it'll seem more significant than it was. Then nine years pass and everything was uneventful up until that point because I hadn't killed anything in nine years. Until the day of my birthday, when I felt the exhilaration of killing for the first time. A second time. Surprise! Surprise! Stanley, you turned the lights on too fast. You blinded the poor kid. Happy, Happy birthday. birthday! Happy birthday! Can you believe it? He is growing up so fast. Happy birthday, pal. I can't believe you're already 10. I'm so proud of you. If only you Congratulations, mother. young man. I don't have to tell you how special this day is. Yeah, you might need to, actually. I'm only 10. I'm not 18. It's not like I can even vote yet. Down here in Vault 101, when you turn 10, well, you're ready to take on your first official vault responsibilities. What the hell kind of place is this that you trust 10-year-olds to make good choices? I guarantee you that if you give me work to do, I'm gonna screw it up, just so you never repeat the mistake of giving me responsibility. So here you are. As Overseer, I hereby present to you your very own Pip-Boy 3000. Get used to it. Get used to it? Man, that's what they said about life, and I still ain't gotten used to it. You have to say thank you and please and can I all the time. I hate it. Are you having a nice party? Ten years old. My, my, my. Seems like only yesterday that your daddy came. Whoa, hey, yo, lady, what the hell is wrong with you? Yeah, my dad came ten years ago, and then I was born nine months later. So what? That's how ah! s*** works. What business is it of yours, huh? What are you, the record keeper of the Association of Historical ah! Stop talking about my dad screwing my mom and showing my birthday present, yo old... ah! Such a nice, polite young man you are. Don't ever lose your gift to speaking your mind so directly. We could use more of that down here. Oh yeah? Well, my dad says it's off-putting that a ten-year-old talks like this. I'm hungry, and that stupid robot destroyed the cake. Give me that sweet roll you got from old lady Palmer. Well, I give you a bite, but you gotta come all the way over here to get it, buddy. I'm only doing this because Bethesda won't let me slap him. And this is confounding because I am playing a guy who would totally slap the hell out of Butch the moment he saw him. And self-defense seems like a really good time to justify it, but this is just one of the many role-playing moments that will be undermined by the design of this game. Hey, that was Jonas on the intercom. He and I have been cooking up a little surprise present. Jonas is waiting for you downstairs on the reactor level. Go ahead. I don't think anyone will mind if you slip out for a few minutes. Then my dad takes me into the basement and hands me my first weapon, a BB gun. And the whole time we walk down to the shooting range, I'm staring at my dad's ass and I have no idea why, but it just looked right to me, like, like a target. Good work. That's one less round roach to deal with. Let's get a picture together. Capture the moment. 
Hey, Jonas, get a picture of me with a big game hunter. Stop screwing around. But my dad had other prey in mind. First is the cockroaches, and the next thing you know, it'll be stray cats. My dad was training me to be a textbook psychopath, and if the FBI ever come looking, I won't be hard to find, because I'll match every criteria in their little diagnostics manual. Another handful of years pass and I'm 16, and the moment I see Butch, it's just like any other day. I start the day by getting a running start, cocking my fist back, and blasting him in the face as hard as I can. Now today is the actual day that I get assigned to a job, and he administer this as a test. All finished? Looks like the diner is going to get a new fry cook. I'll just say this once. Hold the mustard, extra pickles. <laughs> Hilarious. Ugh. Listen, I was just as obnoxious at your age. I didn't take the goat seriously, and look where I ended up. Just between you and me. The whole test is a joke. If you don't like the results, I can make your goat come out any way you want. Then what's the point of the ah! damn test then? We're running out of my allocated work count for this section, so I'll cut straight to the point. Oh, to wake know up. These things. I'm not going to be around to hold your hand forever. Come on, you've got to wake up. My eyes are open, I'm staring directly at you, and I'm standing up. How much more awake do I need to be? Don't be a smart mouth, this is serious. My father's men are looking for you. They've already killed Jonas. You've got to get out of here. And there's something that Amada says here that really sets me off. She says, Oh, one more thing. I stole my father's pistol. I hope you won't need it, but you'd better take it just in case. I hope you're joking. Even with that pistol, I don't think you'll win a fight against the whole security force. And I was going to spare them. I really was. But there was just something about the way she said it that I decided to beat everyone to death with my bare hands. You got to help me. My mom's trapped in there with the rat roaches. Butch. I know we haven't always seen eye to eye on things, and I know that we often fight, but I would be honored to help save your drunken ah! mom. Oh my god! Thank you! I didn't know what to do! You're the best! Alright, Butchie, I'm gonna need some time in here alone with your mom, alright? Bro! I knew she was a drunk. Butch, you're not gonna believe this. Your mom had two full bottles of vodka on her. She's dead! She's dead and you could have helped and you didn't! And that's because I don't like you, Butch. Get away from me! I'm gonna need a disguise to get past all these cops that are looking for me. Yes, hello, Mr. Police Officer. It's me, Ellen Deloria. Man. Oh, you're lucky it was me who found you. The others won't be so forgiving. I don't know what you're up to, and I, I don't want to know. Just just clear out of here, and I'll pretend I never saw you. But you're a good kid. Yes, he's a very good kid. Aren't you? Yeah, I'm a really good kid. You didn't do anything to deserve this. Go find your dad if you can. Yeah, sure, I'll go find my fucking dad. Ellen says bye. Wave bye, Ellen. I was gonna head straight for the door and get the hell out of this place, but then I came across that girl, Amada, and her dad, and it looked like he was interrogating her, so I stopped by to say hi. He's here! Don't let him get away! Who are you talking to right now? Stop for the name of the Overseer! Oh! Good, you're leaving. I guess you were trying to help me, but you... You didn't have to kill him! Ah! How do you know what I need to do? You don't live in my head? You don't hear the voices that I hear? Oh, really? And who appointed you judge, jury, and executioner? God did. Do you know more than God? So anyway, I left my newly orphaned friend behind in the vault. And the first time I ever saw the real light of day was the true awakening of my destiny as the most deadly killer in the wasteland. My name is Polly Walnuts, and this is my origin story. After you leave the vault, you'll be assaulted by mission screens informing you that you bought DLC for a game that you would call tolerable. Tolerable in a way a hot leather seat and a drop top is on a sunny day. It's okay because the pain is temporary and a brisk pace will cool you down, but I'm what you might call a masochist. 
I've only played through this game once, and I never came back to it. Why? Well, in two words, Subway's behemoth. In Fallout 3, you're a brain-damaged man or lady who slipped their leash and escaped the vault. Your mission? To look for daddy. What do you do in this game? You literally go and find your daddy. That's the whole mission. Find daddy and resolve your daddy issues. That's it. No idea why they decided to base the actions of this epic reboot of a franchise that had previously been left for dead and resurrected only to tell the story of a man-child who will literally go through hell to find his daddy because it's either that or learn how to cook and clean up after himself. I remember the first time I played this. I was put off by the whole story and decided to look at it like a fun sandbox. One that you explore in, not follow the breadcrumbs of the main story, and it's clear that Bethesda meant for you to experience the game that way, because the second main story mission has you going up against a horde of super mutants and a super mutant behemoth. And it's like, yeah, I get it, you're supposed to sympathize with this guy who's looking for his daddy, but how the hell do you sympathize with a guy who gets all misty talking about his dad that left him in a vault to die by himself while he goes off doing god knows what out in the wasteland? This is supposed to be the sequel to Fallout 2, a game where your motivation seems small, to save your village from a drought, but even that plot thread felt more important than Fallout 3's. Yes, your dad ran off, but when are you gonna step out from your father's shadow and become your own man, dude? I can't picture a less interesting story to base a franchise on, so I was in a hurry to advance the story and get to the point where things got interesting. The worst part of the game is about to happen and it's always the part where I bounce off this game, the subways. I get to this part and I realize that this game is not like Morrowind. You're not gonna explore every inch of this place from beginning of the game unless you know the maze-like structure of the subways, you're gonna need some directions. So so at this point, what I like to do is get all the side quests and exploring out of the way, do the family mission, free the hostages from the police station that have been taken over by super mutants, and I like to be about level 9 before I do anything in the subways. It's not that they're hard, there's ways to avoid the combat entirely. It's more like I'm putting off the inevitable because I hate the subways in this game so much that it's almost irrational at this point. If the game is going to put me through this pain, then I'm going to treat the game the same way. I'm going to take a torch to everything that Bethesda built. I'm going to ruin every quest, destroy the lives of every family. I will be a force of evil throughout the wasteland. To be evil is to destroy hope. What do people think when they look at Megaton? Do you think they look at a city devoted to mediocrity, using expensive fuel just to power their ridiculous door? No. When people look at Megaton, they see hope. Just as long as we understand each other. This here is my town. These are my people. You so much as breathe wrong, and I'm gonna ah! inch ya. They don't see the gigantic nuke sitting in the middle of a radioactive pool, no. They see a thriving town in the middle of the most dangerous place on the planet, and what they see is hope. We need to show them the truth, that there is no hope in the desert. She will take you when the time comes, and she takes everyone, including my dear old, loving, caring, philandering, mom-hating dad. Rule number one, if there's hope, there's an alternative to you. We could go the route of politician and damn the place as a den of sin and vice, but we have a better and more immediate solution at hand. I exit the cave a new man and ready to begin my journey. Many of the homes on this street were completely destroyed when the bombs first went off, and homes that were not destroyed were boarded up tight. And this was the first house that wasn't boarded up and abandoned. Someone must be living inside. So I cased the joint. Who the hell are you? Where'd you come from? Did Moriarty send you? Colin Moriarty, the owner of Moriarty's Saloon in Megaton. That sack of shit is convinced that I'm some crazy junkie who stole money from him. Oh, well, you probably shouldn't have told me that. Now it all makes sense with you living out here and all. I'm probably the first person to stumble on you, huh? Give me the money. Look, I don't know who you are. I'm not just handing over my life's earnings to you. Well, oakley dokley then. You're not getting a damn thing from me. You hear me? Not a damn thing! Holy shit, lady! Look at all them caps! Money means hope for the future. Keep them desperate, keep them poor, keep them hungry. Well, you know the rest. Now it's time to find this asshole Moriarty. If not to find out where my dad went, but also to ask him why he keeps his safe unlocked. If it wasn't for kids like you, there wouldn't be any thiever in this world! We gotta clean up this crime scene, though. Can't be leaving her on the floor like that. Let's make this look like an accident. And the final details... Yeah, that's perfect. 
With this many drugs on her, they'll never notice all the bullet wounds. Okay, now normally I would head right off to Megaton to cause some trouble, but I found this schoolhouse full of sadistic cannibals. So I went inside, you know, to see if they were hiring, and they attacked me. That kind of thing has to be punished, so I went through the entire base full of raiders, turning them into chunky salsa, and ate through all my ammo in the process. And I murdered an entire schoolhouse full of people and ants, and I didn't even level up for the effort. You know how much EXP you get for killing someone? 10 experience points. I don't know about you, but I like to think my life is worth more than 10 experience points. Then we get the Megaton, the place with the bomb in the middle of it. It's controlled by Sheriff Daisy Hat here, and he don't like me one bit. Name's Lucas Sims, town sheriff, and mayor too, when the need arises. So that's the way it's gonna be, huh? That's fine. That's fine. Just as long as we understand each other. This here is my town. These are my people. You so much as breathe wrong, and I'm gonna f***ing end ya. Now, I can't afford a shootout in broad daylight, but I promise you this, Sims. When I get ya, you won't see it coming. The Sims guy gives us permission to look at the bomb if we cross our heart, hope to die, shove a needle in our eye, pinky promise not to blow the entire town up. Listen, this whole <coughs> thing is dumb. In fact, let's break down why Megaton deserves to die. First off, dumb. This is dumb. They moved in around a completely useless but very dangerous bomb. A bomb they knew was still active. Not only did they know it was active, but they left it in the middle of the town, not fenced it in or buried it in concrete or even putting it under heavy protection. Just out there in the middle of the town, out in the open for some kid to come by and start throwing a tennis ball into it or screwing with the number pad. So that's the most egregious reason. The whole premise goes beyond satire or black comedy and straight into absurdity, which when used sparingly can be interesting, you know, like a spice in a dish, right? But when used as a premise in a game with a grounded story like find your missing father, it makes the people in that town feel like they're just blatantly stupid because you can't want us to believe in the world you've created if you don't take your own rules seriously. My God, it's you. The little baby boy all grown up. Persistent little bastard, ain't you? Then and now it would seem. It's been a long time, kid. The second reason is in-universe. This whole place is nothing but a den for thieves. We've got this lady stealing from this guy, and we got this guy extorting people for information. This guy, Moriarty, will only tell us where our dad is if we pay him 100 caps. And technically, I have 100 caps of his money. And yes, I could easily give it to him, but I'm not one for blackmail. We're a fan of those that do blackmail. So I go around the corner of the building and wait until midnight. And just as Moriarty is calling it a night and heading to his office to start his nightly journaling routine, I sneak in behind him, close the door, and crit him from behind, killing him instantly. On his body was a key and a password for his computer terminal, and on the journal is a detailed description of my father, James, and all his details on his comings and goings. I was to find some guy named Three Dog who used to have six dogs in his chest, but he let three of them out. So now I have the information I need. This town has become worthless to me, and just as I was about to leave the scene of my crime, someone in the bar waved me down. My, my. Just when I had all but given up hope. My dear boy. I'm very happy to make your acquaintance. I am Mr. Burke. A well-dressed man adorned in scents, not unpleasant, with a voice that sounded like the man gargled pebbles. The man was Burke, and he already knew my intentions. In fact, he was offering to make the job that much easier. I have in my possession a fusion pulse charge, constructed for a singular purpose. The detonation of that bomb and as a sweetener, a little reward upon completion. So I head down to the bomb while everyone is off in their bedrooms sleeping, and I place the detonator on the control panel and walk off like nothing happened. The pulse charge is rigged. Excellent. Excellent! Ah, oh, the anticipation is palpable, isn't it? When you have finished savoring the moment, you may have the honor of pressing the button. Oh, and mind your eyes, it'll be brighter than bright.
help, of course. Quite right. And you are to offer him the reward we discussed. Now, all this bright light and wind has given me quite a thirst. Where's my scotch? I'll send someone up as soon as I've completed business with our friend here. My god. What transcendent beauty. What purifying light. <clears throat> uh, allow me to collect myself, as I'm sure you're anxious to collect your payment. I have been asked to extend to you an invitation to reside at Tenpenny Tower. Here's the key and deed to your new master suite. It's on the top floor, first door on your right from the elevator. Enjoy your new accommodations. By destroying Megaton, we have not only destroyed a major trading hub, but we've effectively driven all the traffic from that area, causing new routes to be drawn. This was the storyline that was featured so heavily in gameplay reveals, so this is the seminal moment that we were promised, but also the promise of what is to come. At least that's the way it was sold to us, but did this game ever top its opening hours of gameplay? Let's find out. My sabotaging Megaton came with a lot of perks, but some that left a bad taste in my mouth. See, there's nothing lower than a bigot. We've got plenty of bottle caps. Let me in, goddammit. How many times do we have to go through this? You're not getting in. I can stand here all day yelling at you through this damn speaker if I have to. I've already told you Tenpenny won't allow zombies to live here. Who the hell are you calling a zombie? You're definitely not human, that's for damn sure. For the last time, no zombies allowed. Can't you tell the difference between me and a feral? Fine, I'll show you the goddamn difference. Just you wait. You'll get yours, all of you. And listen, I know these people were nice enough to open up their home to me, but it just don't sit right with me, so I got to thinking. Maybe I should give that guy Ron or whatever, you know, the ugly dude. Yeah, him. For the last time, get your rotten, ugly, goddamn ghoul ass off Mr. Tenpenny's private property. Damn! See, I thought about gas in the basement and events, but then I saw that there were ghouls in the containment center, and I asked myself, how does one get this bothersome door open, releasing hell into this hotel? I bet this guy knows. See, this is rule number two of evil. If the client gives you money for a job, they'll give you even more when they're dead. And this is almost always the case, especially, I'm guessing, for a place as nice as Tenpenny Tower. Ghoul or not, I must inform you that you are trespassing on Alistair Tenpenny's private property. Renders an official business only. He's expecting you? Why didn't you say so right away? Just a moment. All right. Come on in. But I warn you, we're watching you. Welcome to Ten Penny Tower. Don't do anything stupid. You see, that right there is the sound of a man who has a good job and doesn't look forward to losing it. It's his safety net, the thing that keeps him fed and happy, and soon, I'm gonna take it from him. Ah yes, Mr. Burke is expecting you. He's waiting for you on the balcony. Don't cause any trouble. Oh yeah, of course. No, I'm just gonna kneel down and tie my shoes real quick. Now, I asked Alistair, the proprietor of this hotel, why he wanted Megaton gone, and this is what he had to say for himself. I complained offhand one day about how I thought that heap of metal on the horizon was a bit of an eyesore. Mr. Burke offered to take care of it. Burke is such an agreeable man, isn't he? I don't know how I got along without him. I practically don't have to think about things anymore. And while Alistair does seem to be an agreeable sort of person, the kind that seemed incapable of bringing harm to a fly, I knew he was a downright killer. And people with his kind of money and his kind of morals can be dangerous to someone like me, so we have to do something about him. We're off to see Reggie, the ghoul in the feral ghoul infested subway system. If I sound depressed, that's because I am. I will say this about Fallout 3. 
They had the difficulty dialed in on those games because the gunplay is just the worst, and it's supposed to be. And that makes you rely heavily on VATS. And VATS introduces a level of difficulty that just wasn't there in a game like Fallout New Vegas. And I understand that the gunplay feels better in that game, I completely agree there, but this game had much better difficulty because normal feels like normal. Hence why I crawl around everywhere hoping to get the first shot off because every advantage counts, especially early on. I wanted to make a special mention of it because I don't think this game gets enough credit for that because it isn't just about the amount of enemies they throw at you, but how often you run out of ammo, the condition of your weapon, when you combine that with also having to rely on a dice roll for attacks to land, you've got a game whose difficulty could be controlled regardless of skill, and it's why I like it and many others probably don't. And I understand and agree with them about why it sucks as well. I prefer these kinds of limitations because it makes me feel like I didn't fail, but my character did. Hence the whole role-playing game genre, you know what I mean? I also like it when my lack of skill is made up for by my character getting a lucky crit. But I still understand why Fallout 4 is so much more popular than 3, and, well, it's not just the gunplay. What are you doing here? It's not safe for your kind around here. After killing my way through what felt like never-ending tunnels, I come to a ghoul in a motorcycle helmet for someone with a hydrocephalic head. He stops me and tells me to put my weapons away. When I tell him that I'm here to see Roy, we're both surprised. He surprised anyone wanted to see Roy, and I was surprised that I remembered his name. What do you want? I just killed a bunch of ferals, and I wanted to make sure none of them were related to you. So you killed a bunch of feral ghouls? Is that supposed to sound impressive? I got no compassion left for those mindless freaks. But they were a nice deterrent keeping out smooth-skinned bastards like yourself. Oh my god, that's a plot twist right there. The guy complaining about bigots ended up being one himself? So, what do you plan on doing after your clan rally? Biding our time, making plans, getting ready. Tenpenny and his pack of elitist wannabes can't keep us out of that tower forever. We've got rights, and we'll take them if they aren't given to us. Rights? What rights? You live in an ungoverned wasteland. You have no rights if no one protects them. That's why you gotta take what's yours. And I might be able to help you with that. I already got a plan. No, I mean a good plan. They think I'm a monster? I'll show them the real monsters. We'll unleash our feral brethren on them. All those bigoted sons of bitches will get torn apart. Trouble is getting past the damn subway access door. I told him I could handle it and I went off to find the key to the back side of this place. And I knew that there was only one place that Alistair would trust the key to a ghoul infested containment area, and that's the back pocket of his head of security, Chief Gustavo. I tried being reasonable, I really did. I asked him to tell me everything he knows about the basement. You mean the generator room? What the hell do you need to know about that for? That area is strictly off limits. Right, but let's act like it's not a big scary secret for a moment and you tell me about it. There's no secret. It's just a sensitive area we don't need idiots and assholes screwing around in. There's an emergency entrance to the tunnels, you know, for when the bombs fell. We siphon power from the metro grid to keep our generators running. But I've got better things to do than play tour guide, so unless there's some kind of emergency, this conversation's over. Okay, what if I promise to be super duper careful and I don't touch anything? I just want to have a look, man. I've got the only key, and I ain't lending it to you. I lost it once and had to make a new one. Tenpenny practically bit my head off, so forget it. Oh, so you're prone to losing it. Okay, never mind, carry on. Okay, now if I get this, then it means that God wants me to flood this hotel with feral ghouls. If I fail, I'll leave these poor people to their fate under God. Yeah, I got it on the first try. Well, if that's not a sign from above, then I don't know what is. Great job, kid. Here, take this mask. It'll keep you safe from the ferals. Just don't get too close to them, or they'll sniff you out. Don't forget to put it on. Yeah, bring it over here.
And with that, another perfectly fine home is destroyed. It was time to adventure out into the wasteland to find the fame that I was looking for. It's time for Fire and Fury. I tried many things to make this game fun. I tried wandering around aimlessly, like I've done in so many other Bethesda titles, but this did not make the game more fun. What it did do is make me run out of ammo and supplies for very little reward for EXP. This is the first Bethesda game where I can say for a fact that it's not worth running around and exploring. The game is ugly and borderline unrewarding. So I went back in search of my daddy, and last I heard he was hanging out with some pothead that called himself Three Dog. In order to get to him, however, I needed to make the long trip across the wasteland and journey into the most unholy of areas, the DC subway system. I'm not going to waste your time and talk about them, suffice to say they're long, underground, and full of people that want to stab you, just like a real subway except you don't have homeless people using the stairs as a toilet. When I got out of the subway, I had to fight through several super mutants, and at the end, a behemoth, which is about three times the size of a normal mutant, and, I mean... I don't, I don't really know what to think of this thing. Every time I play this game, I forget about the behemoths. The only original thing they put into this game, and it's the least inspired, least interesting thing they could have done. First off, why? Just look at this thing. Can you imagine what a super mutant that size requires as a daily intake of calories? If it's like three sizes larger than a Brock Lesnar, then this thing would need about 6,000 to 8,000 calories a day just to maintain its weight and musculature. I mean, it just couldn't survive in the wasteland very long before it starved or became emaciated. I mean, this thing isn't the West Coast. You don't see a lot of Brahmin or Bighorners out this way. In fact, I've traveled a lot in the DC wasteland and I don't see much in terms of anything in terms of livestock or food. So what the hell do these people eat? I know I gave New Vegas a hard time for this, but compared to Fallout 3, what New Vegas did was absolutely legendary. Every time I play a Bethesda Fallout, I always walk away with more questions than they seem to have answers for. And you, well, I know who you are. Heard about you leaving that vault, traveling the unknown, just like dear old dad, huh? Yeah, just like my dad, except I didn't leave my kid alone in a vault to die! So where is the old bastard anyway? Hey, hey, one thing at a time. Nah, your old man ain't here. Not anymore. He heard old Three Dog on the radio. Figured I knew what was what out here in the Capital Wasteland. And he was right. So I filled the old man in. But he split. I don't understand. What exactly did he come here to find out? Like, I don't get it. Everywhere you go around here, people already seem to know, not only know my dad, but have a pass with him, which means he had some experience in the wasteland, to the point where he knows not only where Rivet City is, but worked in their lab. So what was it exactly he was hoping to get out of you, a disc jockey? This is a prime example of and then writing, right? Like, uh, Matt Stone and Trey Parker talk about this in their, uh, in their talk. They, they said that when they're writing an episode of South Park, they always do because structure. Because this happens, this happens, right? But if you ever have a plot outline that says, and then this happens, you're in real trouble, right? And that's this whole game. This whole game is and then, and then. No, and then! And then. No and then. And then. No and then. And then. So what this self-inflated hat made of balloon asses wants you to do is head over to a museum and steal a satellite dish, then replace a dish that the super mutants destroyed. On the way to the mission, I was attacked by several super mutants, some at very long ranges, and it was basically a sprint to get to the mission. The tangle with those guys out in the open, that's a drain on resources. And again, supplies are expensive and rare, so we have to make a decision. Do I gain the experience or do I save my wallet? I'm going to choose my wallet every time because the fights are too numerous and the rewards are pitiful. Once you're indoors, that's a different story. First off, combat is sort of guaranteed. There's a lot of encounters and yes, you could probably sneak through them, but you are passing up supplies and EXP. When I say outdoor encounters aren't worth the effort, I say that because at a certain distance, you can't hit the vital spots as well as you can close up, at least in the beginning. What ends up happening is you get hit a lot more when you're out in the open, in the cities, at long distance, than you do in hallways. The trade's worth it because you spend a lot less ammo to take down creatures and recoup more for a net gain, and on top of that, you won't need to heal even a tenth of the damage that you would outdoors. 
To elaborate on that point, most of the places you explore just glorified dungeons. Lots of narrow pathways and short hallways. Easy to not only get the drop on an enemy, but to close distance to blast them with a shotgun, or even better, close up headshots with a rifle. Three taps in their asses are coffin stuffers. So because of this, I found myself running around in the open world, sprinting from one destination to the next, running past hordes of enemies that weren't worth killing because if I engaged in every battle, then I would be broke by the time I got to the next town. I wouldn't die, the combat's too easy for that, no. My death would be the kind of a thousand cuts. You know, death from exposure, death from supply drainage. In the OG Fallout's death came in much the way you would expect, from levels 1 to 5, usually a couple of bullets or a blast from an automatic weapon. It was hard to kill someone with a gun because, well, a bullet is pretty deadly. You could die from a single round at level 1, so finding a weapon was not only incredible feeling and valuable, but whenever you found ammo for it and got to use it, you felt like a god, plucking lives from the earth one bullet at a time. Not only that, but when it came time to sell a weapon, you made money. Real hard cash. Every fight was worth at least trying because if you won, you were rewarded for that effort. In Fallout 3, not only do you hardly find anything of value on dead bodies, but a hunting rifle, which used to sell for over 800 caps in the OG game, now sells for 26 caps because not only will you find them everywhere, but you'll be fighting so many enemies with them that you'll have about a hundred of them every time you travel to a new area. So the whole exercise feels tedious because there's no challenge to the combat. The combat is far too overutilized and the rewards for engaging with it don't overcome the ah! barrier that I normally erect whenever a game has bored me this thoroughly. Then you ask, what is left if the combat is unrewarding? Well, you got a story, sort of. The story of a grown-ass man looking for his daddy schnookamookums. After fixing a satellite dish, Three Dog fills you in. When your dad passed through here, he and I talked for a good long time. He's a real stand-up kind of guy. Yeah, unless you're related to him. He mentioned some scientific mumbo-jumbo, which didn't make sense to me. And mentioned something called Project Purity. He also said something about going to visit a Dr. Lee in Rivet City. So if you were hoping to understand why your dad came over here, what he needed to get from 3Dog, and what 3Dog actually told him, well you're out of luck because it's never explained. Isn't that cool? So our next stop is Rivet City, and it's a settlement inside of a wrecked aircraft carrier. Not a city built from the scrap of an aircraft carrier, but just some people living in a beached and split in half aircraft carrier. Huh? Isn't that cool? To get onto the carrier, the bridge has to be extended out, so this is the second city that not only has working electricity, but uses the electricity to open doors to its town. Fabulous. We meet with Dr. Lee, and she has this to say. You were too young to remember, and I suppose James never spoke of me. Typical. I'm Dr. Madison Lee. I worked with your parents many years ago. Now I run the science lab here in Rivet City. It was all I had left. When your mother died, your father decided to leave with you. He abandoned our work. We had no choice but to do the same. So the plot thickens. Why did my dad want to talk to Three Dog? Who knows? Why did my dad come to Rivet City? Who knows? I wonder if any of these questions will be answered. Then she asked me about the vault. And instead of getting a chance to tell her that my father abandoned me and left me to die, I only get three responses, none of which actually sum up the experience in the vault. This game won't even let you roleplay. So why? Why did my father come to meet you? Your father insisted that we return to work on Project Purity. I tried telling him too much time has passed. There's no way it would work. Predictably, he refused to listen to me. He says he can prove it will work and head it off to the old lab. I'm sorry, I don't know what else to tell you. It's in the old Jefferson Memorial Building, northwest of here. Please, don't go after him. It was foolish of him to even think about going there alone. So Daddams went to the Jefferson Memorial Building, which is teeming with super mutants like an outside dog is with fleas, and he somehow was able to sneak past them and spend enough time there unnoticed to record like 10 audio logs, yet was still absent-minded enough to leave three of them there. The recordings are the only clue we have for where to go next, but luckily, as some would say, conveniently, Pops left his next location on one of the recordings, even though he supposedly had no clue we would even be following him. I'm off to Vault 112 to search for anything of Bourne's that might help me get this purifier up and running. 
All I know is that it's west of some place called Evergreen Mills, and it's well hidden in some sort of garage. I, I have to. It's so close. But that's the story of Project Purity, isn't it? An eternity of almost theirs. So Dad tracked down some guy named Brandon to Vault 112, and he conveniently left directions for us, which I only assume he did because the waypoint got automatically added to my pit boy the moment I heard his tapes. Normally you'd have to walk clean across the map to get to the next point, but I'd already been there, so I fast traveled to the gulch and found a gas station that housed the vault. You might be thinking that this story is going to be me always one step behind my dad, and you'd be wrong about that. You do, after much hunting and pecking, find your dad, and this may sound amazing, but I actually felt like skipping this next part. The most unique part of the game I felt like skipping entirely. Why? Because, again, I feel like I'm saying this a lot, but because it's boring. This is Pleasantville, and in Pleasantville, everyone is pleasant, except for the demonic child that is always stabbing everyone's cats to death at the park across the street. This girl is a guy named Strauss, or Braun, or Von Strassenbraun, and he's German, you could tell by the accent. Oh, someone new to play with. What good luck I have lately. I was just starting to get bored. Oh, we're going to have so much fun. I'm Betty. I live here on Tranquility Lane. Want to play a game? <laughs> you don't get to say no. Okay, ah. calm down. It's easy. You make Timmy Newsbaum cry. And I'll help you. If you don't, then I guess you're stuck here. There's only one way I know about to make a kid cry. Ow! And you said you didn't want to play. I was hoping for more than fisticuffs, but entertainment has been difficult to come by lately. Consider the game won. And with that, you win a prize. Your prize is one question, which I will answer to the best of my ability. Oh my, what a splendid turn of events. I had no idea the two of you were related. Yes, I have indeed seen him. I'm afraid he's rather unavailable at the moment. So this guy will have you run around tormenting the inhabitants in the metaverse until the end where you set yourself and your dad free. Son, you've saved me. I was afraid I'd be trapped in there forever. It's so good to see you, but, but what are you doing here? Well, I didn't expect Dr. Braun to be alive and insane. I thought I'd just find notes or holotapes. I needed information about Braun and his work on the Gek. And all I wanted to do was be mean to my dad to make him feel bad for leaving me in the vault to die. Instead, the game wouldn't even let me do that. So there's only one thing left to do. Rule number... whatever of being evil. Never let a personal slight pass in the slightest. Hey there. I brought you into this world. What in God's name is wrong with you? Screwing around. Son, I brought you in. I think. Hey there. Good to see you. Will you? Stop screwing around. Wait a minute. My dad's immortal? Ah, ah. Damn it, Bethesda. Why can't I roleplay in your roleplaying game? This is a big problem for me, and this happened right around the time that this game, and Oblivion, came out. Unkillable NPCs. It's especially irritating because of the fact that Bethesda already has examples of more open gameplay in the very same game. The fact that I could kill Moriarty and pull all my info about my dad off of his computer is the very same kind of design that I'm talking about here. Just because an NPC died doesn't mean that the game is over. And more when they allowed you to kill every quest NPC in the game, including demigods. And if you did that, you basically make it so you can never finish the game, but you could still play the game. Then Bethesda added the ability for NPCs to travel across the land, but that led to NPCs getting killed on their way to do something, which players didn't like either. 
Moriarty's mission is an example of killing an NPC but still being able to finish the mission, but instead of doing that, they did what is possibly the laziest thing you could possibly do, which is make the NPC immortal. Let's look at this from all angles. Dad has to travel from Rivet City all the way to the Jefferson Memorial. On the way, he's going to meet a lot of opposition. He could, theoretically, die on his way there. So Bethesda gave him half a million hit points and immortality to ensure that this doesn't happen. So what's the point of having him walk anywhere when you could just have him teleport to the location instead? If you're going to have him walk, doesn't it make sense that the player, if they cared at all about the dad character, would follow him and ensure that he gets the Project Purity unmolested? If the dad could die, then if the player didn't escort him, they would have to go back and find their dad's body and collect whatever research he had on his body, or reload if they cared that Liam Neeson never made it. That would make there be an actual reason why NPCs travel in the wasteland so that the player has to escort them to ensure their survival. Doing it the way Bethesda did it, there's no point in escorting him, and when the player finds out he's immortal, they'll get pissed off and never try escorting ever again, and instead, they'll fast travel everywhere and be forced to wait for the goofy-ass AI to wind and twist its way to Project Purity or whatever meeting place they're supposed to meet at. I waited at Project Purity for like 10 minutes before my dad made it, and all I could think of was, why is this happening? Why is this game making me wait? How much more of this game do I have to put myself through? Alright, so daddy wants us to help him now that we found him, but not in any way that a real father would want us to help out. Hello. We can't accomplish anything until we can get inside, but none of us are particularly capable fighters. I hate to ask you to put yourself in harm's way, but you seem to have learned to handle yourself. I need you to go in and make sure it's safe for Dr. Lee and her crew. I got a bunch of problems with this, but the biggest problem I have with this mission is that it makes a pacifist playthrough nearly impossible. The coolest thing I always thought about Fallout 1 and 2 was that its world was made more believable by the fact that a smart, weak-limbed little nobody could survive in a wasteland and never had to kill anyone if they didn't want to. Fallout 3 didn't get this memo because you cannot make it through this part without killing every last super mutant in the place. You can have your companions do it, but is that really a pacifist playthrough if you're ordering people to die? Was Stalin a pacifist? I hate this because it's so antithetical to the design of the original games. There's no other option that I know of for dealing with the super mutants. You could do a pacifist run if you have a companion, but it's a major pain in the ass and totally not worth the hassle. On top of this, what the hell is wrong with your dad? What kind of dad is like, okay, son, listen up. I need you to go into this place and get possibly eaten by cannibalistic humanoids dwelling underground. Do you think you could do that for me, champ? I thought Liam Neeson was supposed to be the badass. He's got half a million friggin' hit points. He was in all those Taken movies. Why am I going in when this dude could kill five guys with just a number two pencil? I'm afraid I don't have many options. Please know that I would never put you in this position if I didn't think it was absolutely necessary. No, asshole, this is the second time you've put me in this situation, and by definition, none of this is absolutely necessary. Each of you assholes could go off and find another job, and I would still be in a vault chilling, minding my business. So I head in, surgically decapitating every super mutant in the place with a shotgun, and after much searching and killing, I go back, covered in blood and bits of super mutant brain matter, to my dad to tell the ah! that it's safe to go inside. Are you alright? Is it safe in there? I'm proud of you. Now let's get in there. Proud of me, he says. Father of the f***ing ah! year over here. I need to ask this ah! asshole some questions. Of course, son. What's on your mind? First off, how could you leave me in the vault to die, you ah! I wanted you to be safe. I didn't want this for you. A life out here in this godforsaken war zone. Yet you're more than willing to send me into that memorial alone to die at the hands of super mutants. Now I see why mom died. Probably so she could get away from you. Oh, my son. If only you could have known how much it meant to her. She believed in the work we were doing and was so determined to see it through. She gave up so much for this project. We all did. And I don't want that to have been for nothing. Two options. Two! And both of them mean the same thing. When all the nerds on No Mutants Allowed were talking about how Bethesda couldn't handle the Fallout franchise, this is what they were talking about. This is it. The perfect example right here. I'm not satisfied with this answer. I want to have it out right here, right now. 
This also brings up one of the main problems with the story. Project Purity is not important to my character. It's only important because the game says it is, and won't let me actively sabotage it until I've gone through the entire game. I could sabotage the whole thing by killing my dad and Dr. Lee, but the game doesn't want me doing that because, well, that would be the end of the game. The bad ending. And that's fine. I'm okay with that. Give me the bad ending. I want this game to be over with already. So let's fast forward this bitch a little. Poppy tells me to run some errands, unclog some drains, flip some switches, like that. And while I'm down there cleaning a massive super mutant duke out of the plumbing, some vertebrates arrive and out pops the enclave. And would you look at this? Two bursts to the head with an early game assault rifle will melt an enclave soldier wearing full power armor. What in the actual f are they smoking over there at Bethesda? By the authority of the president, this facility is now under United States government control. The person in charge is to step forward immediately and turn over all materials related to this project. That's quite impossible. This is a private project. The Enclave has no authority here. Who needs authority when you have a gun? I'm going to have to ask you to leave at once. Am I to assume, sir, that you are in charge? Yes, I'm responsible for this project. Then I repeat, sir, that you are hereby instructed to immediately hand over all materials related to the purifier. I'm sorry, but that's... Furthermore, you are to assist Enclave scientists in assuming control of the administration and operation of this facility at once. Colonel, is it Colonel? I'm sorry, but the facility is not operational. It never has been. I'm afraid you're wasting your time here. Sir, this is the last time I am going to repeat myself. Stand down at once and turn over control of this facility. Colonel, I assure you that this facility will not function. We have never been able to successfully replicate test results. I suggest you comply immediately, sir, in order to prevent any more incidents. Are we clear? Yes, Colonel. I'll do whatever you want. There's no need for more violence. Then you will immediately hand over all materials related to this project aid us in making it operational at once. Very well. Give me a few moments to bring the system online. I grow tired of waiting. Nearly finished. Run. Run! So wait a minute, you can kill him, but I can't? So we escape the building and Dr. Lee informs me that there's a tunnel that leads down and right up to the Brotherhood of Steel headquarters. This section is so buggy that half the time the people following you will cower and start running around, aggroing every creature in the area. And you're forced to kill soldiers who have no way of even pathfinding their way to you before the doctors will follow you again. It's a really stupid series of events that doesn't work very well. Once you get to Citadel, you'll be told to talk to Rothschild, and after some conversation with him, I'm directed to Little Lamplight, which... Oh my god. If some little kid pointed a gun at Polly Walnuts and said he wasn't coming in, well, let's just say that this version of Polly would have made him disappear. But Bethesda was like, oh, hell nah. Every kid in this game is immortal, regardless of whether it makes sense or limits role playing. We want you to do things the way we scripted them, and that's that. So this kid tells me that I need to head over to Paradise Falls and free a couple kids from slavery. So as we all know, I'm not a big fan of slavery, so I head through the wasteland. I use up all my ammo on mutants and raiders and eventually see the giant statue in the distance signaling my approach to Paradise Falls. I head into Paradise only after I intimidate the guy guarding the gate, and in response, not only does he let me in, but he gives me a Mesmatron and a bunch of collars. And you know what I'm thinking? I'm thinking I'm gonna go back to Little Lamplight and use this Mesmatron on the kid guarding the gate. And this is where the little tiny child hands of Todd Howard come up and say no, because not only are you not able to kill these kids, as we've already established, but you can't even pull out your weapon here, which means I can't mez the mayor to get in, which also means that, once again, I'm unable to roleplay the way I wanted to. Isn't that cool? It's just really weird that Bethesda decided to give me a cool weapon that could do cool things, but then doesn't let me use it to complete the mission I'm currently on. It's so f***ing 
dumb. I'm not the player. I'm a guy who is being given a tour around the game world, led from objective to objective by a busybody school marm who slaps my knuckles with a ruler every time I try to be clever. Again, this is Fallout, but in name only. So I only have one choice. Kill all the slavers. I'm sure I could do some other sh but why would I? Like, honestly, what's the point? The game decided what was best for me, and I'm just here to experience the narrative and move on. And this right here, this is why this game isn't worth your time. It starts off strong, but as the game drags on, it gets weaker and weaker until the game just seems to give up on player choice and goes linearly through the open world. If Bethesda deserves recognition for something, it's somehow managing to make an open world not only feel empty, but boring and linear. Don't know how they managed to do it, but they did it, so... Congrats, I guess. You again? I told you to get lost! I guess you're okay after all, Mungo. You can come in, but you better not piss me off. Okay, so you get in, but I got my eye on you. You don't make any trouble in here, got it? I ain't having no ah. shit butts making trouble. Little Lamplight is stupid. I hate this place. This whole thing is in service to a joke. What if kids ran the world? All you need to do is examine the premise and the whole thing falls apart. But you're not supposed to analyze a joke, I can hear some of you thinking. Well, in Fallout 1, the joke areas were separated from the main story. They were the game version of a meme, and you had to be lucky to discover them in the first place. Little Lamplight is the Bob's pre-owned car mart of Fallout 3. It's a special random encounter that was made into a main area that has nothing to contribute but a joke. So if they're gonna put their jokes front and center like this and make it a part of the main story, then I'm gonna analyze it. First off, let's examine the premise. This is a town run by kids with guns and there's not one mass shooting? Okay, yeah, bold choice. But let's really look at this idea of a town full of kids that expel the eldest kids. How do they decide the age of a kid that leaves the city is a mystery? Perhaps it's the first time they complain that there's never anything to do and everybody's lame. Either way, you got kids, all of which are between the ages of 8 and 12, and I have only one question. Where do you get new kids from? I mean, I could see this working out in one way. Little lamplighters get kicked out at the age of 16, go to big town, do some, you know, stuff and junk with one another and a baby comes out nine months later. Then the mother and father drop the baby off at Little Lamplight and what do they feed the kid when they get there? Because no one's lactating. I didn't see any babies and I don't see anyone old enough to do the deed. No one over or under a certain age is there either. So again, where do they get fresh kids? Why didn't I see any teens in Lamplight? Seriously, this is the laziest shit I've ever seen. A lazy joke with tired execution. The other answer could be that the kids hear about this place ran by kids without any adults and it sounds like paradise to them, so when their dad gets to beating their ass one too many times, they run away towards Lamplight. But, uh, I traveled across this wasteland and I was beat up by super mutants, centaurs, raiders, and slavers, and I've been killing shit since I was 10 and I had a hard time trekking across the wastes. I mean, these kids have enough personnel to defend their town from super mutant raids, something that, by the way, Big Town couldn't do with the people who have full motor control of their body at that age, and we're supposed to believe that on top of all of that, that they get new recruits through runaways that somehow manage to make it the lamplight, unkilled or unslaved. I have a hard time believing all that. And while we're on the topic of super mutants, how, just how? In order to talk about that, we need to talk about what the kids like to call murder pass. It's not safe, even for someone as brave as you. There's monsters back there. Yeah, I do. It's through murder pass. Not a real safe way to go, but it's the only door that works. It's the only way that works, yeah. The other door hasn't worked since before I was here. Computer's busted and not even Joseph can make it work. If you didn't concentrate on science, you won't be able to open the, quote, safer door, so you'll have to take Murder Pass, which is blocked and guarded by a gate with just one little girl guarding it. Now, let's not even talk about the fact that there's no mechanism for making the gate work, like a switch or something like that, because if there was, then we wouldn't be forced to convince the mayor to open it for us. But what I want is for you to look at what these kids call a gate. It's a bunch of nailed together plywood. How is that gonna keep out a super mutant, let alone a super mutant with a rocket launcher, huh? Or, 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 or just a motivated super mutant 
with more than one friend who could lift him up over this gate. I mean, if all the super mutants, of which I counted no less than 33, at least 10 super mutant brutes and five super mutant masters, if all those mutants decided to attack the town all at once, well, I'd say that's a force that could easily overwhelm Peter Pan and the Island of Misfit Children. So not only is it a hard premise to square with the reality of the desert, it's also hard to square the fact that they can successfully defend the integrity of their town against the platoon of super mutants with a plywood gate and eight kids with one gun to defend it. So the mayor opens the flimsy wooden gate for you through some apparently invisible means and we're off to kill 30-something super mutants to steal a geck. See, even the MacGuffin isn't unique. Everything is a thing from another thing. ATSTs, ATSTs. And eventually we'll meet up with some handsome piece of green meat named Fox. My name's Fox. I've lived in this cage all my life. Yes, indeed it is ironic. Forgive my astonishment, but I hadn't expected to meet someone with such a learned outlook of these things. It is a pleasant change. Seems racist to me, like, yeah, sure they eat people, but you don't know what they're like when they're alone. They could be really sweet and loving to one another. Now we have... We, we we have the wrong perspective on this thing. Think about it like this. You're hungry. You haven't eaten in days. And while you're hanging with your friends, a chicken walks out into the middle of the road, right? You chase after it and wring its neck before it can get hit by the car. And later, you have a nice chicken stew with your family. But now, instead of thinking about it from the person's perspective, think about the chicken, right? You're enjoying a nice stroll in the grass, the breeze, cooling down your feathers as you approach a road. You do everything you're supposed to do. You even look both ways. But as you're looking down the road, you see a man running towards you and you freeze in place. The man twists your head until you feel a pop and a crack and the lights go out. You're the chicken in this scenario and the super mutant is the human. Yeah, you see, you're the link in the chain of nature. So that's why we got to eliminate them any way we can. There are predators. You think that the chicken cared if you lived or died? A fox will help you get the geck by going into the highly irradiated area for you and retrieving it. As promised, yeah, here's the geck. I hope it's worth it. And then you're strolling out to head back to Project Purity when a bright light puts you to sleep. Objective is secured, sir. Good work, soldier. Make sure the Gek is secured aboard my Vertibird. Yes, sir. I'll have the text come down and remove it immediately, sir. You're certain he's unharmed? Yes, sir. He'll pass out shortly, but we can revive him. Excellent. Prepare him for transport immediately. Now, I can't think of a single time that a Fallout game, other than 4, took control away from the player like this and forced them into a lose state without even giving them an option to avoid it. This is Bethesda, once again, wrapping your knuckles, telling you to pay attention because Bethesda has something very important to show you. You get kidnapped by the Enclave, taken to a secret torture site. You're awake. Let's keep this nice and simple. You're going to tell me the code for that purifier, and you're going to tell me now. Oh, I beg to differ. I won't be telling you anything because Bethesda won't let me. If I tell you the code, you kill me. If I don't tell you the code, you let me go. I want to work for you, Autumn, but Bethesda won't let me, which seems to be a running theme in this game. Why do you insist on making things difficult? Maybe I should start shooting. How much blood you think you can afford to lose before you tell me what I want to know? Colonel, I have need of you. Mr. President, I have no time for other matters. I'll be with you shortly. Now, Colonel. Yes, sir. Ah, alone at last. I do apologize for Colonel Autumn's attitude. He's been under a great deal of stress lately. I 
have no doubt that you know who I am. I'm sure you've heard my radio broadcasts. I'd like to have a word with you face to face. I think there are a few things that you and I should discuss. Eden wants you to work for him. The Enclave wants a pure wasteland, one where unmutated humans can presumably live underground like mole rats for the rest of their lives. I'm warned by my own dialogue that choosing to help Eden with this plan of poisoning the proverbial well will kill everyone in the wasteland who didn't grow up in the vault. And since my whole thing has been to burn down everything Bethesda created, this is the ultimate ah! you, right? Bethesda even acknowledges what a dick move basically everything you did was, and they really guilt trip you on the whole thing at the end. And so it was that the lone wanderer ventured forth from Vault 101, intent on discovering the fate of a father who had once sacrificed the future of humanity for that of his only child. Uh, that's certainly a way to look at it, I guess. The Capital Wasteland proved a cruel, inhospitable place, and the lone wanderer ultimately surrendered to the vices that had claimed so many others. Selfishness, greed. What? I that that was that was some other guy. Wait, what? Did they just not like record anything for Megaton? Wait, for real? It was not until the end of this long road that the lone wanderer was faced with that greatest of virtues, sacrifice. But the child refused to follow the father's selfless example. Instead allowing a true hero to venture into the irradiated control chamber of Project Purity. Hey, whoa, hold up there, Skip. It's not my fault that she went in there. She could have said no. I mean, Falk says no, and he's immune to radiation. Am I any worse than that guy? <sighs> I think not. I want to leave you with this thought. This guy, James, his whole life's work was creating technology that can purify water. He does this in a world that has water chips. In a world where every vault in the waste had a water chip purifying their water. So the game spends a large amount of time in the logs trying to justify why this story even exists, explaining that the water chip couldn't be used, but never explain why a duplicate couldn't be made outside the vault using the same technology the vault had inside of it. All of this shit that you went through is in service to fixing an already fixed problem. Do you feel like your time has been wasted? Because so do I.